see the way they hate And I know better than to listen to the people who are calling us names Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian, and today is Wednesday, September 20th, 2023, and this is episode 526 of the Lots Project podcast, where we're defying norms and designing freedom. Today's episode is titled, One Bird, Lots of Hustle, Making the Most of Your Chickens. Today, I'll be diving into all the side hustles that we've ran or uh, considered running with our chickens when we were on the homestead. But first, let's grab that cup of coffee, catch up on what's going on, and have a little chat. We'll dive into that topic in just a little bit. How we doing? Good morning, good morning. Pip, how we doing? I see in the comments there, uh, not too far before the show. Sadly, you missed Taco Tuesdays. I don't think we talked about tacos yesterday, so I think, you, uh, I think you're safe on that. But Welcome to Wacky Wednesdays, or I don't know what the whatever that will be called. But uh, anyway, what's in the cup this morning? I got Ethiopian Light again. Uh, that's going to be all week, I suppose, and it is it is still great. It is still great. Um, what do we have to talk about in coffee chat today? Yesterday, I um, had a little bit of a surprise. We were. We were sitting here in the morning doing our normal morning routine. Um, everything was going as planned, and uh, it was a it was a quote unquote office day or prep day. I was going. I uh, had plans to get all my episodes laid out for the rest of the week, and everything published, and had a few other things on the list. Along with that, I was hoping to take a, a nice uh, nice shower in the in the outdoor shower there that we have set up. I was planning on making a video about the outdoor shower as setup that we have with our instant water heater and uh, pop-up tent that we we purchased and talk about that and how we did it and why we did it. And um, so I got to a point where I was ready to go get cleaned up and make the video and this and that. And uh, I walk outside, I, I um, jump in the shower, I zip it up and... Um, and I um, turned the water on, nothing came out. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Uh, did Corey go turn the valve off? I didn't think that was uh, didn't think that was a, um, a possibility, really. Uh, messed around with it a little bit, turned it on, turned it off, uh, made sure that the that everything looked right. Put my shorts back on, jumped out, walked over to the other hose that we used to fill the camper, turned that on, nothing. And I'm like the hell's going on so i sat there for a minute thought about it and uh really ran through the scenarios in my head and i realized that it probably wasn't our our situation that was causing this i figured that uh, there was something going on and i remembered um <laughs> i remembered that the day before i had gone to to dump the garbage at the at the corner place down here the convenience center the the, the transfer station i guess is what it would be called um, and I noticed a guy had taken, um, had taken road cones and barriers across the street. Uh, we're, we're only, you know, like a hundred yards from a corner. And then, so when I drive down there, I saw that he was across the street and he was kind of standing there with his hands on his hips with these barriers and cones and there was water bubbling out of the ground. And I was like, huh, he's got something going on there. And it's on the corner with a uh, with an abandoned old gas station, and so there's nobody around there. There's no houses or anything, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, he's got a job to fix. Well, come find out. Um, yesterday they did the fix. I, I eventually, after checking it three or four hundred times throughout throughout the day, waiting to take a shower, I jumped in the truck. I went and ran to the gas station. I, I go uh, to the corner, and sure as shit, there is a uh, a backhoe there big old hole uh, inside the barriers that were there and nobody to be seen. He was either in the hole or they were off at lunch, but there were no trucks there and uh, there was tobacco there. So I have to assume that they were, they were off to lunch. But anyway, I didn't end up getting in my shower yesterday because it didn't come on until, uh, I don't know, that was after four when we took the dogs for a walk and uh, there it was, it was on. So uh, had to wait till today. Had to wait. Corey had to suffer through me smelling, um, me smelling bad, I guess. So 
Anyway, uh, MSU Rifle is wondering uh, if I'm going to the Back to the Land Festival in Centerville, Tennessee this weekend. I, I am not. I, I am not. I've heard of it. Um, and uh, with SRF and um, and plans like that, I uh, I didn't um, I didn't look into going. So sticking with SRF this year and uh, maybe hit some more things next year. But uh, that was that was kind of what was in the plans. So. Have to let me know how it goes. Pip says I'm going to do a shower scene. Um, I'm going to do a clothed shower um, video of our setup. I, I, uh, I don't think anybody wants to see me in the shower. I mean, maybe they do. Maybe they do. Corey, you want to see me in the shower? <laughs> she doesn't want to see me in the shower either. <laughs> anyway, uh, what else do we have on the list? Um, other day, I forgot to mention that all the six six pounds and an ounce have uh, have been uh, sold, accounted for, and shipped out. They are on their way to their final destination. Um, kind of. Well, they're all purchased and accounted for, and uh, everything is is out that should be. Uh, so that's good. But there are still silver sets available if you want. Uh, I have uh, round two available. Um, I have a few of them left. I've been I've been holding on to them to do direct in person sales uh, for anyone that wants them at SRF. I gotta circle back after that. I have a few left, not a ton by any means, and um, depending on what sells at SRF, I'll I'll figure out if it's worth getting the listing up on the website or um, or I might just uh, stash them and stack them or yeah. Who knows? Who knows what will happen with them? But hopefully, they uh, hopefully a bunch of them disappear at SRF. If you are interested in one, I am I'm more than happy to mail you out one. If you're not coming to SRF, if you're not uh, if you're not local here, but you want to pick up one of the the sets of silver round two, let me know, and uh, I can get that out to you. And then also, I noticed that uh, somebody is trying to raise some funds for a project and they have uh, set one and set two matching numbers uh, from both sets with the certificates, authenticity and everything uh, for sale in the Telegram chat. So check that out. And, uh, and if you're interested in getting two sets all at once, all the same number, which you can't do right now. Um, I know there's a handful of people that have those in their possession that uh, might be willing to give them up. I know one person's trying to trying to sell them, but um, yeah, you can't get them from me. Uh, all set one was sold out quick. Set two, I uh, I sold out the pre-sale and and then um, held on to a bunch. So um, the odds of getting getting all four to a set uh, would be hmm, be pretty pretty interesting uh, perspective if you were trying to hunt that down. So that's available in the Telegram chat and also in over in the Two Chicks Homestead uh, uh, chat on Telegram. And if, you, if you're interested in it and you're not on Telegram or anything, feel free to just email me and I can get you a hold, get you in touch with them. So that is, uh, that is on the silver. Um, setting up the, the workshop workday down at Delinquent's Gully was talking to Tim a little bit yesterday. We we held off to make sure make sure we knew when he was getting down here. He has uh, he has some time down here prior to all of that, and uh, we have some things to get done before him and I have some things to get done before we can really have uh, a bunch of people on site. And um, things were kind of in the air until till some uh, till some decisions were made. Some uh, some surprises came up, which was cool uh, that I think are going to make things a lot easier. But um, when when Tim gets down here, we have a we have a punch list that we want to get done. And uh, as we see that develop, we'll definitely have more idea of what we're going to try to accomplish on the workday and um, and what kind of tools we'll need and things like that. So it's uh it's still kind of in the air it's it's uh it's planned for the day i think if anything else if anything it's going to be a, a nice get together and um and we'll get some things accomplished but as of right now the actual work project list is is like i said it's kind of still in the air tim and i uh tim and i have a week to pound out some things and then um then have that list but more details to come soon and uh, as soon as i have them i'll post them in the the workshop 
or the workshop uh, Delinquents Gully Workday Telegram group. We've popped one of those up. It's been pretty quiet because we don't have a lot of whole a lot of information as of yet. It uh, it kind of really is riding on what we get done um, and um, what needs to be done. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. It'll be a lot of fun to uh, to get together with a bunch of folks. And even if we don't get a lot of work done, it will be uh, it will be good to see them and kind of a pre-buffer to SRF and um, and some time to talk and chat when uh, when we don't have the, the the chaos of the festival going on. So I think it'll be good. I think it'll be good. I think it's uh, Tim and I, when I talked with him yesterday, are definitely on the same page as far as uh, punch list and things. So that's that's going to work great. And I'm sure we'll get we'll get stuff accomplished. That's just the way of the community. And uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It's it's not far away. I was looking at the calendar and that's why I reached out to Tim. I was like, oh, man, he's going to be down here next week. <laughs> on a stop on his uh, travels from festival to festival and uh, then and then uh, over here and then off to some other places uh, to talk and back again for SRF. So what do we got about uh, it'll be one, two, three weeks from tomorrow, I believe is the work day. I think we landed on Thursday the 9th. Uh, wait. Oh. <sighs> Yes. E Wait, why is this calendar? Oh, that's September. Huh. <laughs> my calendar. My calendar was uh, is all screwy. Excuse me. Thursday the 12th is going to be that day. Uh, the Thursday before SRF, which is uh, 14th and the 15th with extended classes on the 13th and the 16th. So. Hey, if you uh, if you don't know about Self Reliance Festival, if you haven't uh, haven't picked up tickets or you're interested in picking up tickets, let uh, let me know or look in that uh, in the in the um, in the audio and video notes. I got a link. Actually, it's in the blog post. I don't think it's in the in the in the show notes. If you go to that blog post at thelotsproject.com, you will see a link to SRF. And uh, you can pick up your tickets there. You can watch it virtually. You can attend in person. I'll be speaking, which is uh, which is it was cool. I'm excited about that. It'll be the first uh, really festival ish that I've I've spoken at. Um, I used to do DJing weddings and things like that. So suppose speaking in front of a crowd isn't uh, something new. Bartending and and the works, but. Um, the first first topical presentation I think that I've uh, I've done in front of a crowd like that, um, especially in this space, especially since we've we've uh, we've we've gone on this journey, and probably since I've met you, I don't think I've ever done any public speaking or anything like that. So, Corey, will, Corey, will get to see how I am before something like that. <laughs> I may I may get a, a little nervous in inside and. Um, not act myself for that's before but yeah we'll see how it goes we'll see how it goes 500 plus episodes of a podcast uh might have changed that quite a bit but i remember i remember doing the big big wedding regions where it was uh three to five hundred people and you know when you walk out there with a mic and nobody knows who you are gives a shit what you have to say it's uh it's definitely a uh it's definitely an acquired skill to jump on that mic and say hello everyone and uh, it's it it comes it comes with it. So I'm excited to get up there and talk. It looks like uh, if the agenda holds true, it'll be Sunday afternoon, late Sunday afternoon before uh, before the wrap up uh, session with with John and Nicole. So that'll be fun. That will be fun for sure. Um, I was going to touch on um, this new law in Minnesota uh, that I was digging into a little bit this morning. It goes into effect in January, but I'll have to save that for later because I want to dig in some more to it, really get some of the of the the finer details so I can speak <laughs> to it more intelligently. But it has to do with like some paid time off um, that they're they're rolling out at the beginning of the year, and um, it's interesting to me. It, it's interesting to me for sure. So I want to dig into that a little bit more, uh, maybe tomorrow, maybe, uh, maybe next week I will hit that during the coffee chat, but, uh, if you're interested, check that out. Just uh, search, um, Minnesota ESSL ESSL 
law or um, something like that. And you should be able to come up with it and um, have fun, have fun thinking about that and uh, doing the mental gymnastics that it takes for politicians to come up with shit like this. So anyway, anyway, we're at quarter after. So let's uh, let's get on to it head on into the the topic of the day, which is going to be a side hustle day. This is a, a side hustle day. I'm going to kind of go through different side hustles that I've done, um, that I've researched and haven't kicked off, that I've done and uh, fell on fell in uh, fell on my face with, didn't work out, things that did work. Um, and I'm not talking about side hustles as in necessarily a side hustle that's going to take off and uh, replace your job. Um, on the farm, our, when we were on the farm, our MO basically was to uh, make a bunch of small streams of income uh, that all added up to something decent. And the reason we did this was in case one went away, in case we lost a big customer, in case anything went sideways, it wasn't the end of the world. Everything was coming in in small streams. So hold on one, guys. Uh, hold on one sec. I'll be right back. All right. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so what I was saying is all our, our goals with uh, side hustles was actually that a side hustle. Um, as far as the farm, we were working. We were both working. Uh, I was working more than full time. Corey was working just under full time. And we had the farm on top of that and everything uh, taking care of the house. We had multiple farm operations going at any one time. At sometimes, uh, man, three or four, five different one things going on. We were busy, um, and it was on purpose. We were trying to to work a five year plan to determine whether we wanted to do this full time as a hobby, if we could make it work as a, as a financial, the financial side for one of our incomes, um, and how that looked. So we put all everything we could into it for the five years. When it came to that five-year plan, it was right around the time. And, you know, there's coincidence, there's there's things that happen. And I think this this these moments sparking out in our lives that um, really made us contemplate leaving Minnesota all came together at around that five years where we were going to evaluate anyway and say, okay, well, we need to work our jobs and just do this as uh, for us, or maybe one of us can quit our job or whatever that looked like. It was coming up on that time to evaluate. So it all worked out. So that was a little of our MO on the side hustles was making a ton of different revenue streams. So you can, you can understand why something like chickens on a farm, um, I really tried to dive in. If I was going to do the work for the chickens, I wanted to not leave anything on the table that was a possibility for a little bit of income. So um, before we get to that, I just wanted to tell you that every day I bring items or a company or a sponsor that I use or recommend uh, related to the topic that we're talking about. Uh, if you purchase these items through the links that I provide in the in the video notes, the audio notes, uh, the blog post, it helps support the Lots Project. Today's is uh, a list of things from Amazon. I did that last week with um, I did that last week with one of the episodes. But today I put a list of some of our favorite things that we purchased on Amazon for these chicken side hustles. They're things that we used, um, things that we used that that changed our mind on how we did things, and uh, other products that just came in handy when we were when we were going through these chicken side hustles. So I will mention those as we go along, and uh, and definitely check those links out. And even if you don't have to pick up anything for a chicken side hustle. Um, <laughs> it, um, it doesn't have to be that item. If you click on our, item, if you click on our links from Amazon and then you go and buy something else, we still get credit for what you bought. Um, it just gets that tracking link in for the day you buy your purchases and we get a little kickback. I don't know who bought what I just get a list of what was bought and, uh, and how much we made off it. So. I appreciate you checking out those links and you can always find more products that we recommend at thelotsproject.com under product reviews. Uh, there's a whole laundry list of things and different styles <laughs> and there should be more coming up 
very soon. So here we go. Chicken side hustle. So these, a lot of these can be done. Everybody thinks you need a big farm to make money off chickens. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you could, you could swing some of these things as small as a, as a dozen or a half a dozen chickens in a, in a, um, in a suburban lot, uh, right up until the full farm where you have a, a shitload of them. Uh, I think our experience, we had, um, we had anywhere from, I think our first order of chickens was 15. So we started a little bit higher than a uh, little bit higher than the average uh, suburban lot where you're going to get a, a half a dozen to a dozen and usually run into restrictions. But we ordered 15. We kind of went down that path. I think at any time, any one time, I think our max layers that were currently laid, they weren't growing. They weren't growing out. They weren't in the incubator, things like that. I think we probably had 80 to 100 on the ground um at the peak we were going through birds so often and and doing different things with them that was hard to quantify literally like actually how many we topped off at and then you had to add on the meat birds that we had out in the field we pasture raised meat birds out in our uh, in our field behind our house in in tractors so if you added them all up i, I just don't have a solid uh, exact number of what we had uh, and like I mentioned, when I was giving you that number, these were the birds that were actually laying. Uh, a lot of our side hustles came from other than that. People think they're going to get their chickens. They're going to lay eggs. They're going to eat their eggs and they're going to sell the excess. And that's what I'm going to make off my chickens. I'm just going to sell extra eggs. Rock on, rock on. Uh, if you eat any, I don't know if you're going to um, you're going to break even by any means. Um, and that's something that to consider too, is it's not all about the actual dollar amount income when it's, when you're starting out, when you're starting out and you're eating, eating your own eggs. Um, you're like, oh man, I'm paying like $5 a dozen because I'm paying for premium food. I'm waiting for these chickens to lay, um, you know, 16 to 20 weeks or even more, depending on when you start them. <clears throat> so you add up all that feed, you get that first egg and you're like, you really think about it. And you're like, damn, this egg cost me like, oh, 80, $90. I don't know. That's just a guess. I have no idea what chicken feed costs right now or what you're feeding your chickens, but it's a lot when that first egg comes out. And then they start kicking them out every day or every other day or whatever, depending on your breed. And it kind of smooths out, but you're never going to get to a 99 cent dozen of eggs, uh, raising them at home. I'm sorry, you're not going to save money by by having chickens and having eggs. So this is really why we went down the line of uh, I think we did get to a point where we might have been close to covering our feed when we had the extreme amount of chickens and we were selling eggs. I think uh, we might have broke even at that point, but we were eating. I don't know, we were eating a dozen or two eggs a week and we were getting 10 dozen eggs a day. That's a lot of eggs uh, to cover that feed bill. Um, so it wasn't really worth it. I think we had to find other other ways to compensate and um, and make up for that feed cost. And this was before the big feed bubble that happened after the fact. So selling eggs, selling eggs is an obvious. Uh, selling eating eggs is obvious. One thing that I realized along the way was I started thinking about um, Hunter said feed just went up again. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, um, man, start start thinking about ways to feed your animals for sure uh, outside the feed store because I think shit's going to get weird real quick. Uh, I haven't been in the space for a while, but just watching and listening outside, it's going to get weird. Um, one of the things I started noticing with the eggs uh and if you do any research into it, if you start getting into chickens and thinking about it, you're going to realize how old the eggs in the store are. 30, 60, 90 days uh, before it even hits the store. So I looked at um, the fact that I was picking up this egg, literally warm. The chicken just hatched it. And I'm saying, if I can get this egg to the customer in two weeks, I'm 
already twice as good as the best egg in the store, the best factory egg in the store. Two weeks, I have to collect it, clean it, get it to the customer. And I started looking at that and I said, okay, well, that's a significant amount of time. What, uh, what can I do in this time? And as we went down the road of building our flock, when we started, we started with a rainbow flock of chickens. It was a, a variety pack of a bunch of different types. We got them in, we raised them, we saw what we liked. Uh, but it was the cheapest and the most efficient way to get into the thing. We bought the chicks. We bought baby chicks. Um, and it was a variety pack. It was what they had left over. As we started determining the breeds we liked, as we started really de deciding what we wanted to raise for us, both personality, um, egg, um, uh, egg production, winter, cold hardiness, things like that. I started looking at the prices of these chicks and I was like, wow, it's expensive to pick what you want. It's like, it's, it's really expensive to pick specific breeds of chickens. And I'm like, all right, how about if I hatch my own? We had messed around with, um, a tabletop incubator. We had gone down the road of um, of considering starting up quail, things like that. Uh, and so we looked into a really nice incubator. Uh, that is one of the things on our list today. And it, uh, it kind of runs through a bunch of these uh, side hustles. But we ended up buying a cabinet incubator, a, a GQF um 1502 cabinet incubator that's that's going to be the first thing on the list it um man the thing is solid if you're looking for an incubator and you're looking to spend some money it's uh they they t you can probably find them set up for around a thousand if you really really hunt about a thousand dollars uh the incubator itself is like i think like eight nine hundred dollars i have a write-up on it um there's a humidity system that we bought Everything that we bought concerning that incubator was worth every single dollar. And I'm pretty sure um, we got way more than our money back during the time we used it with all the birds we sold out of it. And then we resold it. It holds value very, very well. So um, if you have the money for that investment, it, it's, uh, it's a great way to bulk up your revenue streams because I realized if I hatched the eggs... I hatched, if I got the chickens, I had to pay this much. If I bought the eggs, if I bought the hatching eggs, I could hatch them myself. And it was a significant savings, but it was still expensive. It was still expensive for the breeds we wanted. And I would, I would browse through those chicken magazines, the chicken catalogs you get in the spring. And I would realize that there were really cool breeds out there. There were really specialty, a, um, specialty breeds that laid cool eggs, that had cool looking birds. Um, and I saw those prices. And I'm like, dang, I don't even have to hatch these things. And all of a sudden it clicked in my head. And I went, why am I selling eating eggs? First of all, I looked into selling hatching eggs. Now, be careful locally um, shipping them. You have to do your due diligence. There's um, there's a uh, certification out there that uh, that is is sometimes required, sometimes not. The rules are really vague. It's state to state. Um, I found that um, that it sometimes applies to where the chicks are born or the eggs are hatched or the eggs are laid, and sometimes it applies to where they're being purchased, depending on uh, the jurisdictions of both. I never went down the line, um, I never went down the line of getting NPIP, I think it's NPIP is what it is, certified. Uh, I started to, uh, I was getting big enough with chicks and uh, running a hatchery that I, I started talking to the state to get done and also be certified as a tester which is another little revenue stream you can come up with. But then uh, then we decided we were moving, COVID hit, all sorts of things happened that I never went through with it. But I did run this for quite a while and uh, it's not required where I was. Um, Hunter said, 
Hunter said local chicks are five to six dollars each. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. So there's that. Um, so I started realizing that if I had my mixed flock, I could gather an egg day one. I could market it as a hatching egg because I had roosters. This is all dependent on having a rooster. If we don't know why we need a rooster to get fertile eggs, um, this show is not going to help you. <coughs> but anyway, if I got this egg on day one, I could market it as a hatching egg. Looking into looking into the biology and the genetics of, uh, of the egg, I, I determined that if I had it shipped within a week of it being laid, it was at its most fertile. After a week, it started to decline significantly. So I would mark it for the first week as a hatching egg. After a week, I would market it as an eating egg. And then I would eat it myself or what? Hey, how are we doing? Um, we, we didn't have a problem getting rid of eggs. So these were our, our mixed flock. Uh, and we were getting a significant amount of money that way. Uh, I was marketing those hatching eggs at, um, at like, I don't know, it was like 10 bucks a dozen. It was, it was, it was cheaper than the, than the catalogs and it was local, uh, but it was mixed flock. I quickly realized looking at the specialties and we really didn't kick this off. I was just putting that out there as an example. We didn't really kick it off until we had isolated breeds. Um, I set up my poultry flock to be able to bring in. I think we did at the time we separated out into individual breeds. We did uh, black copper Morans. We did speckled Sussex and we did barred rock and we had them separated with their own rooster. So they were pure, um those were pure eggs and if you look up what a black copper moran a french black copper moran egg if you look at it, it looks like a chocolate egg in uh in the summer uh they actually get darker and lighter throughout the year uh, but the peak of the the richness and the darkness of the egg comes in the middle of summer uh i was selling those for 30 dollars a dozen i bought them for more than that but my lines hadn't been established long enough that I felt like I was at their level. She was a, a sh selling show chickens, uh, but I bought those those hatching eggs. I was selling those for thirty dollars a dozen. If they didn't sell in the first week, I sold them as eating eggs, or I ate them myself. I sold them for six dollars a dozen. Um, at different times a year, like Hunter said, local chicks were five to six dollars each. Black copper Moran chicks are way more expensive. If you look at the catalogs and you realize what kind of chickens you have and focus on raising those ones, you have an opportunity to try to sell them expensive, the eggs, and then try to sell them as eating eggs. You can also hatch the chicks and sell the day old chicks. Local day old chicks at five to $6 a each. I'm guessing those are barred rock. Those are barnyard hens. Those are, um, are not specialty breeds. Look up what specialty chicks cost and realize that if you put in the front, if you put the money in up front, you're going to get this over and over. They're laying eggs every day. They're laying you money every day. So sell the eggs. Everybody sells eggs. But think about a different way to sell the eggs. Sell them as hatching eggs. Take those eggs, get yourself an incubator and hatch them yourselves. Sell day old chicks. Like I say here in the comments, five to six dollars each. It takes 28 days, I believe, to chickens. I, I hatched way more quail than I did chickens, but we hatched chickens. Uh, I found quail way more lucrative, but we did the same systems with chickens. Um, selling hatching eggs, selling day old chicks. You put them in the incubator, you uh, account for the, the water, the electricity, the time, and you sell them day old. You pre sell them day old. Don't sell all of them. If you sent, um, if you send, or if you set uh, two dozen eggs and you know that your hatch rate is ninety percent, uh, don't sell twenty four chicks. Sell a little less than what you expect, pre-sold, and then have some extras. A lot of the times, people that are going to buy them pre-sale when you when they show up and you're like, hey, I had an, a, a good hatch, I have an extra four or five, uh, they'll just pick them up right there. 
like chicken math is real and use that to your advantage. But pre-sell those day olds, pre-sell, um, pre-selling day olds, you have 28 days to sell the chickens. Um, the way I ran it with my quail is I was get a, I would get a list of people, how many they wanted. And my incubator was running constantly and on cycles. So I was having chicks hatch every week. Basically, I set up my list and how many everybody wanted. And as they hatched, I just called them and told them. And I explained this up front that it might not be the 25th. It might be the next the next Saturday. Um, and being up front about it, maybe giving a little bit of a discount because of that is, uh, is a good thing. But I would sell those chicks. I would also hold chicks back. And this is what I would do with my extras a lot of times was... Uh, Oh, right about the same time. I got my notes from yesterday and it was right about the same time the Starlink went out. Satellite must be going past the tree or something outside. That's that's great, Elon. I really appreciate that. Um, but anyway, you would think that I was going to sell the or uh, replace my flock with those. No, that was another revenue stream that we used. I didn't only sold, say, sell day old chicks. I would raise them until they had feathers, until they... Uh, we're okay, you know, a little more robust. People don't want to do the little brooder thing. They don't want to take care of the little fluffy chicks and deal with that stuff. They want to be able to just put them in their coop and let them raise up. If you can raise them to feathered out, you can raise them for a few more weeks. Calculate what kind of food you get into them. Chicks don't eat that much. I mean, they eat more than you would think, but they don't eat that much compared to a, a whole bird. But figure out what you use, how many chicks you raise, divide it out. Add that much more to your day-old chick price. Sell feathered out chicks. Uh, did pretty good with that. Another thing we did really good with with those chicks is if they didn't sell then, uh, and this all came by came true when I was just not good at selling chickens. Uh, I was had some left over. We let them get a little older, and get a little older, and I could add more price. And then I realized that if I raise them to, say, 15 weeks, 16 weeks, where they are just about ready to lay or maybe laid that first egg, you can sell them for a significant amount of money. If you explain to somebody or someone has experienced raising chickens, you can tell, you can explain to them, these chickens are laying. You don't have to wait that 16 to 20 weeks. You don't have to feed them for 16 to 20 weeks, hoping to get that first egg. These are getting ready to lay. They're primed and ready to lay. X amount of dollars, saves you amount of feed. Do the math for them. When you do math for people and you lay out costs and say, okay, well, this chick is going to be $20. I have X amount of feed into it. You would have had to raise it, blah, 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 this whole thing. Uh, people realize that... Um, that it's a deal that it's uh, that you did the hard work you did the you did the work without the 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 um the return of the eggs every day so <laughs> that's kind of the line i did with live birds uh was i would sell that day old chick i would sell it a little bit older uh, feathered out or even at the at the stage that it's about ready to lay um and i uh, i don't want to forget after the fact uh, there were two other ways that we sold live birds. Our, I needed not this not to happen today. I needed not to have to edit out a bunch of dead air because I have stuff I have to do right after the show. But uh, hey, you know, it is what it is. Um, so there were two other ways that we sold live birds. Our cycle on our birds was two years. It, um, birds lay longer than that. Birds live way, they live way longer than that. They lay longer than that but i didn't want to see a production drop and at two years i know they still have egg production i know that they still are going to eat bugs i know that they're they're going to be decent birds they're going to live for a couple more years um they're at kind of that peak where they aren't consuming as much food and if you free range them they are able to kind of sustain a lot of their own so i was like I don't want to call these birds. I think there's still value there. I don't want to feed them because I got another set coming in. I started trying to sell two-year-old birds and I marketed them as two-year-old birds. 
We got some egg laying left, a year or two of egg laying left. It's going to start slowing down. Very upfront about that. Um, they're two years old. They're not going to be great for um, for culling and eating. You're going to want stew, stew, uh, stew, or uh, stewers out of them, uh, slow cookers, whatever. Uh, but man, great, great bug control. They're going to pop out eggs for you. Uh, you could start a your own flock if you want to pick up a rooster too. Um, and so I sold them at a little bit of a discount compared to the ones that are obviously just starting to lay. But you got to think, I got a year, two seasons of laying out of them. Ish, close. Uh, so I had all those eggs. I had all that profit out of them. And then I'm still selling them on the back end to someone that's also going to get value out of them. Um, so that was another way I sold live birds. And the final way, I guess they weren't live. If we got birds that were old, uh, that we didn't sell our free rangers that we let, uh, we let go and just kind of live out their life. If, uh, if we needed to get rid of them, or if we got an order from a customer or two that we had that liked those old, really fatty hens, they weren't eating them. They were making medicine out of the fat. They loved them. Find an outlet for, um, find an outlet for those old nasty hens you don't want to eat. Find an outlet for them. Um, our our customer loved them, just called and uh, and gutted them out. We didn't need to process them much more than that. Throw them in a bag and freeze them. Just love to thaw them out and get all that old, um, old rich fat out of those old hens. So she was buying those at a, at a steep discount. Uh, basically covered our bags and our time. But you have to think all of the the production i had gotten out of that hen and i'm still able to get a little bit of income coming out to cover what i'm doing to get it out the door so yeah so live birds we're going to sell chicks day old chicks a little older feathered out chicks right before they lay after they're on their way out and then when they're stupid super old and get called on the farm and uh, finding some outlet for them that way those are the ways i really sold the chickens the the chickens we had the our production chickens um obviously meat birds you know you know you can sell meat birds you can sell the chicken the chicken that's what everybody thinks about uh i'm gonna hold chicken i got breasts i got legs whatever i got cut-ups i got bur whole birds sell the parts too and that's going to kind of go down the road to the thing that i was most lucrative in across the board um any livestock that we did uh, the most money I made rabbits, quail, chickens, hands down was in the raw pet food market. Um, definitely don't forget about that. If you're having trouble selling your products, if you're having trouble navigating, um, restrictions and processing laws and selling laws, things like that, definitely look into raw food, definitely raw pet food. I shouldn't say <laughs> don't eat your raw chicken, please. Um, Look into raw pet food feeders, uh, people that feed their pets, their dogs, their cats, raw food diets. It is a, a very niche market. Uh, if you raise a quality product on your farm, there are quite a few people out there that are looking for quality, humanely raised, um, higher end feed, people that want to give their pet the best they can do. And this is what they've come to determine is the best food they can get them. Um, there are a lot of pre-ground and, and pre-done pre sources out there for food. You have to look at that. You have to find out um, what they're selling for in your area. But talk to those clients. Find that one client for raw food. And um, man, Facebook Facebook uh, groups and Craigslist are, are, uh, are my go-to for finding that. I talk to people, uh, and once you find that first customer, they they value you. And as long as you let them know they're going to get theirs, they will definitely share you with their friends. They all talk. They all try to source meat. They all try to find vendors because it's an underfilled niche at this point. And I don't think it's ever going to be full. I think that there's enough market there that people... People need the product, uh, as far as I can see, especially in my area, and that included like the the greater Twin Cities area is, is what I kind of marketed into. It um, it needed to be filled, and there were a ton of people doing it. It's it's um, it's a weird market. 
Uh, it seems like the more people are into it, the more people get into it uh, because people are transitioning their dogs and getting new dogs and things like that all the time. But anyway, I would sell heads uh, when we would process birds and this would be um, this would be meat birds or layers, uh, heads, feet, organs all went to the raw food people. I would sell um, anywhere from a day old chick. I got into uh, talking to some people about balut eggs, actually never went down that line, messed around with it, thought about it. And um, it wasn't something I really wanted to explore and I didn't have enough interest in, into it. But if you don't know what a balut egg is, um, you can look it up. I would sell day old chicks all the way through um, all the way through adult birds. And I would call them the way they wanted. And this went for all the animals I sold into the raw food market, but I would call them um, whole because there's a whole prey model of raw food. Uh, I would, I would, and then everything down to process, processing them like a human grade, uh, like I was doing it for myself. Um, uh, processed, uh, viscerated and, and cleaned and, and all of that. So anything in between, whatever the customer wanted, and I think that's one of the reasons I was so successful with it was I was willing to work with the customer. I knew the value that they were going to, they, they were going to keep buying stuff from me. Um, when you're feeding a dog raw food, you can't like bounce back and forth. Once you find a supply, you stick with it. Once you find a supply that's willing to work with you and give you what you need. Um, I had cat customers. I had people that had, that fed their, their dogs raw cat food. Um, they need smaller portions. They need day old chicks. They need uh, day old quail. They need smaller things. Uh, I was willing to listen to that. I was willing to adjust for them. I found them through uh, their dog. They fed their dog. And once I started talking to them and telling them that I did, you know, take orders, it wasn't going to be overnight. I didn't have a freezer full of these. But hey, if you need you need, you need a hundred day old chicks, boom. Um, I figured out a way to call them. So they looked whole and live. I didn't have to cut their heads off. Um, that's a whole nother episode, but, um, yes. So sold, sold into the raw, raw dog food market, uh, everywhere from day old to, um, day old to full grown and all sorts of different, um, different, uh, processing types. Um, so I was talking here. I, I kind of jumped some over something on my list that uh, I wanted to bring you. Actually, all three of them is kind of managing uh, managing that chicken operation uh, where I was raising, hatching, raising and selling at different ages, how to keep them all straight, how to keep them healthy and uh, how to keep your eggs organized. Uh, one thing on the list uh, are these egg racks that we use. They're a plastic egg rack. They look like um, they look like the big gray three dozen packs you can get at the store, or two dozen packs, uh, just flat racks that stack on top of each other. They're plastic. Uh, they're great. I linked to the ones we use. They were generic. They were kind of flimsy when we got them. I was like, oh man, I don't know about this. Basically, once you figured out how they stacked onto each other, because you had to like flip it over and turn it because they were all mirrors of each other. Um, you got the eggs in them. They were pretty solid. I don't think we ever had any accidents where um, they tipped over or anything like that, but it was a great way to store our eggs safely um, and out of the way. They went vertical. We didn't have egg cartons piled up everywhere that they could uh, get in a tall, tall stack and fall over. Um, and then they transitioned easily into the racks that um, went into the incubator. If you have the GQF incubator, the racks that they come with them, these were way cheaper to store. Literally, you could buy the extra racks for the incubator and store your eggs in there. Mm, it's expensive. This was a cheaper way to go for that. Uh, so those egg racks are in the in the notes along with the incubator. Chicken bands, I I, um, I highly suggest using them to keep track of your birds. You're gonna think you're gonna be able to tell the difference, but when they start uh, they start growing. And they get to a certain age, they all look the same. Having bands on their legs when they're chicks and being able to record that and, and get the date of birth and the breed of the chicken is fantastic. Uh, I listed to a actual search, uh, Amazon search for chicken bands. 
you do your preference. It's really going to depend on the birds you're raising, uh, the size of the birds, how old they're going to get. Um, and save your bands. Don't send them with your customers, man. When you have to pick those birds up to put them in a, in a kennel or whatever to transport them, pop that band off, save that. It's going to save you money. Um, we, uh, we ended up burying a bunch until we realized that maybe we should take those things off. We would always forget. We'd always forget, um, when we ended up having to call some birds, <coughs> but anyway, the chicken bands were there. And the biggest thing I wanted to mention on this list, um, for, um, safety really and something that we fell in love with and it seemed like the birds liked it more we liked it more uh it was way safer is the sweeter heater uh i listed to one they come in different sizes they sell more directly through their website but i did find them on amazon and they are uh, the same price so you can check them out there if you want uh you can go check them out on their site i appreciate it if you check them out on amazon but what the sweeter heater is is a suspendable um, infrared heater. Uh, it looks just like a white, it was like a white rectangular box with a plug that came off it. And it, it had chains to hang it. And basically it warms up without a fire risk. It warms up without a, um, it's not gonna tip over. It's not a heat lamp. It doesn't get hot to the touch, um, but the chicks come in and under it. You can adjust the height of it. They huddle under it. They come back out. We never had a problem with chicks being cold when you had this. They make different sizes for the different amount of chicks you want to use. They have um, they have different models to go over a brooder, uh, even for some supplemental heat when the birds kind of went out of the brooder pan down into our, our main um, holding pen. If, um, if it was too cold, we had some of these in there. And they really liked them. And it made us sleep better at night that we weren't going to wake up and have uh, our chicken coop on fire from a, uh, a chicken landing on a heat lamp and knocking it into the pine chips. You hear the horror stories of fires from heaters. Uh, the sweeter heater is what we went to. It is expensive. It, well, for what it is, it's not expensive, I don't think. For the peace of mind, for the, the comfort of the birds and everything like that. I don't think it's that expensive. I think the largest one is actually under $200. Um, and it, it will get a couple dozen birds under it, I believe, is their, is their listing. We, uh, we had that one in our main chicken pen, and we loved it. So I would check those out if you're raising birds. Uh, I wanted to hit those before the end of the episode just to, uh, just to make sure that you heard about that. If you're raising chickens, if you're using heat lamps, even in your brooders, Consider a sweeter heater or something like it, even that uh, that's a lot safer. Because I would hate to see anything uh, anything happen. Um, let me look at my list here. I talked about selling eggs, selling hatching eggs. Um, you can ground up your eggshells. It's it's a very small a very small revenue stream. But man, if you're going to the farmers market and you got a bunch of ground up eggshells, you will probably be able to move it. Um, processed meat birds. Uh, I didn't mention doing classes. I know Nate and Aaron over at Two Chicks Homestead and uh, Nicole Sauce at Living Free in Tennessee and a bunch of other people that have done processing classes on the day they're going to be doing their chickens anyway. Uh, either they just do the class or they uh, order a few extra birds, sell the extra birds, and the person goes with the bird and the education. Um, you can think about that. Doing classes, a little extra uh, revenue stream, something you're doing already. Uh, then I talked about selling day-old chicks selling the uh, feathered out chicks, selling the almost laying hens, and then selling those old hens after the fact, um, maybe when they're still laying or at the end uh, when someone is just using them for bug control or, like I said, the, the medicinal value of the fat. Um, you can also, some things I didn't uh, hit on. Oh, oh no. Oh, wait. Raw food. Um, yeah. Any size bird. Be custom for the people and uh and you're gonna you're gonna write your own ticket uh heads feet organs whole birds part parted birds um clean birds just charge accordingly for what the work you're doing and the value you're giving them um uh, hatching service you can hatch eggs for people if people have um fertile eggs and they don't have an incubator and you're getting good you're getting consistent results from your incubator Throw out there on Craigslist or Facebook in the chicken groups that are local to you. I'm willing to hatch eggs for you guys. Um, set their eggs. 
give them their chicks back. Make sure you get, don't guarantee uh, what your hatch rate is going to be or anything like that. But it's a nice option for a little extra cash or just doing a good solid, uh, um, a good solid favor for your neighbor. Um, making the compost when you have the amount of birds we had, we made a lot of compost with our chicken bedding, uh, more than we could use in our gardens. Uh, you can bag it up and sell it. Save your feed bags, save your feed bags. They're great for putting compost in and selling, uh, selling that. If you use those plastic feed bags, you're always wondering what to do with them instead of throwing them out. Uh, depending on the breed you got, uh, depending on the feathers, you can collect feathers, you can sell those. That's another, um, that's another side hustle uh, that I didn't ever get into. I did look into it. Uh, there is a market out there for nice, cool looking feathers. Uh, people use them in tying flies. They use them for a bunch of crafts and things like that. So really check out your birds, check out some cool feathers, maybe collect some and uh, put a listing up online. Uh, you never know. You never know what you're going to do with that. That is a huge list, guys. That's a, a lot about chickens real fast in this 45 minutes. I appreciate you listening. Um, if you have any questions, you want to discuss any of them further, you're more than welcome to email me, message me, uh, email info at thelotsproject.com, or you go to thelotsproject.com and all our socials are listed across the top. You can click on any of those, connect with me any place. Uh, probably the easiest, quickest place would be Telegram. If you go to t.me slash lots chat or t.me slash lots feed uh, and you find my name, click on it, message me directly, and I will uh, I will get a hold of you there. Other than that, guys, it's uh, it's a Wednesday. This was another side hustle day. We're talking chickens. Uh, we'll move on through a bunch of different things, uh, different little side hustles that I've done uh, as this topic continues. If there's something you wanted me to explore or you want to uh, maybe talk about a side hustle you did, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I wouldn't mind exploring that idea. But uh, for now, we'll wrap it up here and get going. Um, tomorrow, what are we talking about tomorrow? Tomorrow, we're going to talk about um, gear, content creator gear. Uh, what I started with, what I thought I needed, what I actually started with, what I've picked up along the way, and if I've upgraded any of those things. So rest assured, after tomorrow. If you're worried you don't have the best equipment to start a podcast or a YouTube channel or anything like that, I'm going to tell you a little different because I started with uh, some pretty basic stuff and uh, not very expensive. So join me tomorrow for that. It's going to be content cre content gear or creator gear, the things I started with and have used so far. Um, I think it'll be a good episode. I think it'll be a good one for sure. Other than that, I don't have much today, guys. We're going to wrap it up. If you'd like to participate in that live comments uh, for each of the live recordings, you can always join us Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. Central on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. I appreciate everyone that pops in and leaves a comment and interacts with the show. If you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with others. You can find a post about the episode along with the links that I mentioned to, and then all links to my social media services I offer, recommended products and companies I'm affiliated with at thelotsproject.com. Be sure to listen on one of your favorite podcasts, 2.0 value for value podcast players like Podverse or Fountain.fm. Drop a five-star review, leave a review, share it with a friend. Be sure to subscribe. Make it a great day, guys. It's hump day. When we join you tomorrow, we will, we will be on the downslide to the weekend. Make it a great one, and we will see you then.